talking. Uh, yeah. I was going to tell you to start recording after I say all of this, okay. <laughs> Anyways, uh, so, yeah, I want to just start off with a few things about the interior abdominal wall lecture. So, it's a very different lecture from what you've taken thus far in terms of anatomy, definitely. It's uh, very, you know, it's, it's very different from, like, the MSK anatomy and even the peritoneum lecture or the GIT lectures. Uh, it requires quite a bit of, like, previous knowledge of how structures... Uh, are laid out in your abdomen and the problem is is most of us don't have that knowledge so we get really confused really fast uh, so i'll try to go like from the basics and yeah any try to, like to go up and build up the interior abdominal wall and everything that is yeah, needed for you to know uh yeah i'm sharing my screen okay yeah so if uh, starting off i will be starting off with uh yanny uh, today I've spent like a few hours already just just researching different uh, from different places. How can I give any of this lecture? So inshallah, I'll be able to do a decent job at it. Um, yeah. So let's start off with the muscles of the interior abdominal wall. Now, the muscles of the interior abdominal wall is probably the simplest concept in the whole lecture. And uh, Yanni, before okay, before before we start with the muscles, actually, let me just pin where is the lecture. But it's like a, okay so before we start with the muscles i want to like skip a few things here and here and just go to like the pelvis itself so one point that the uh, doctor really emphasizes here is like any the parts of the pelvis that you really need to know and you really should know what the anterior superior iliac spine is what the pubic tubercle is the pubic uh, tubercle here the symphysis here the crest here, all of these are just landmarks in the pu in the pubis and in the pelvic, pelvic in general, pelvis. And lastly, we have the pectineal line, which is just this line over here that you can see. Just the border, basically, uh, that connects, I think, the pubic uh, pubis to the um, ilium. Uh, so all of these are important structures to keep in mind when we're talking about uh, what we'll be talking about. Now, the inguinal ligament is a very, very important landmark and very, very important structure in the human body that will be talked about you know, more than once, for sure. And it's basically a structure that connects your ASIS with the pubic tubercle, okay? So it goes from the anterior superior iliac spine from both sides to the pubic tubercle. And then there's like an extra part that just goes, rounds back and goes back to the uh, pectineal line and then runs on the pectineal line. So this small part is called the lacunar ligament and then when it runs on the pectineal line it's called the pectineal, pectineal ligament. As you can see here that's our inguinal ligament then it goes yeah and you just round a bit from the inguinal ligament to the pectineal uh, line and this small part here this is what we call the lacunar ligament and then we run from the pectineal ligament uh, or on the pectineal line, and this is what we call the pectineal ligament. So, do you understand these three ligaments? One, two, three. Please, if anybody wants to ask me something, ask me on the like, not the private chat. Ask me on uh, the like whole chat because <coughs> so other people see and don't see any and see any get confused. Why is he repeating? Okay. Uh, again, so when we're looking at the pelvis. Uh, I don't know, can, for the PowerPoint, uh, this is basically, they took pictures of the lecture, I, I believe, so, I don't know, you can ask in the group. Uh, again, so, we have the pelvis here. This, right here, is the anterior superior iliac spine. You took, you took the inguinal uh, ligament in MSK, I believe, so, anterior superior iliac spine. We have here the pubic symphysis, the crest, and the tubercle. All of these are just landmarks that you should keep in mind, because stuff attached into them. And lastly, we have this right here, the, the line that is basically connecting your pubis to your ilium. And this, we call it kind of like, oh, the um, pectineal line. Okay. Uh, didn't I, uh, you weren't here maybe from the start, but what, I, what I'm saying is, you know, I'll be taking it the way I want to take it. I will not be following the, slide, the lecture. Uh, I will just give you the ideas and then I'll see if there's anything I missed in the lecture. Anyways. So that's 
our fictional line, and then we have the inguinal ligament. The inguinal ligament goes from the ASIS to the pubic tubercle, yeah? And then it basically like does a U-turn and then runs on the pictinial line. So the part that's going to the pubic tubercle is what we call the inguinal ligament, as you can see here. Then the U-turn, we call it the lacunar ligament, and then the part that runs on the pectineal line, we call it the pectineal ligament. Okay, just that's the basic idea of these three uh, these three structures, and yeah, you should keep them uh, in mind uh, from now on. Now, now that we're done basically with the uh, part about the pelvis, just a brief part about the pelvis, we can talk a bit more about the muscles themselves. Okay. Now, the muscles themselves that we have, or like, generally, I like to call this the anterior lateral uh, abdominal wall because really the most of the muscles that we'll be talking about are like lateral, more so, more than uh, anterior, yeah? Uh, the ASIS is the anterior superior iliac spine. You took this in MSK. Okay, so we have the transverse, the first muscle. Okay, so let's start from uh, building up the uh, the muscles, okay? So our deepest muscle, as you can see here, the deepest muscle is the transversus abdominis, okay? This muscle, it's just, as the name says, it's transverse, so all of its uh, fibers are going transversely, all right? As you can see here, transversus abdominis. And it's going from, like, a few of the coastal uh, ribs and then attaching into both the, um, the iliac crest the a bit of the inguinal ligament as you can see here and it also attaches into this line this line is what we call the linea alba which literally means the white line and it's basically a, a collection of tendons okay a collection of just connective tissue that runs between the xiphoid process and the pubic symphysis okay and it's basically just a collection of these structures that just it's, it became so strong because it's a collection of a lot of um, different fibers. So stuff just insert into it and it gives them like strength. This is a concept that you will see repeated a lot in the human body. There's one in the abdomen, linea alba. There's another one in the back. That's just a collection of tendons. There's one in your uh, like perineal area called the perineal body, etc. It's just a collection of these tendons joining together and it's becoming like really strong. So this is our linea alba, right? So our deepest muscle is the transverse abdominis. Then we have this muscle. This muscle is the internal oblique. So oblique means that it's not going transversely. It's going a bit obliquely. And it starts, basically originates from your pelvis, from the um, iliac crest, basically, and goes up. So it goes up towards the, as you can see, it goes up towards the ribs. It goes up towards the linea alba. And some of it goes like transversely, but all of it basically goes into the linea alba and a bit to the inguinal, uh, inguinal ligament, okay? Now, so, Yanni, the idea is the internal oblique, you can know that it's an internal oblique because it's going up from the pelvis towards the coastal margin or like the ribs. On the other hand, the, uh, yeah, this is our external oblique. The external oblique, you can, uh, you can see that it's going basically down. So if you put like your fingers on your uh, ribs, you, usually they call this like the side pocket muscle because like it acts like when you put your fingers in your side pocket, you put it down and basically that's the direction of the external oblique, okay? So we, uh, as you can see here, we have our transversus abdominis, our internal oblique and our external oblique. These three muscles, make a big part of our anterior lateral abdominal wall. Now, their functions are pretty simple, like, you know, contain the organs, give support, twist movements, uh, yeah, mostly twist movements of the abdomen and the trunk. Simple stuff, I believe. And yeah, that's the first part, which is the three muscles. Now we have another muscle that's going from basically the anterior side, which is our rectus abdominis. Now, this is the abs, basically, the six backs, the abs that we have. And this one, as you can see here, it's just going straight down like this. 
uh, going from your coastal margin almost to your pubic symphysis. And you know, the whole idea of this muscle is that it initiates your flexion of the abdomen. So your crunches, basically. Your crunches are done by this muscle. Okay? So this is our muscles. But see, we have one point that we need to notice. All of these muscles, as you can see here, all of these muscles, the muscle fiber, the, a crunch, man, uh, like a setup. A setup, a crunch. Uh, again, if you please don't direct, uh, send a direct message to me. It's much better if you just ask it on the, uh, you know, the general chat. Anyways, uh, so these three muscles, we have the transversus, we have the internal and we have the external oblique all of them as you can see they the muscle fibers end here you see the muscle fiber ends here the muscle fiber ends here the muscle fiber ends here okay the so they're just the muscle itself is lateral on the medial side you have what we call an aponeurosis now in foundation you took what an aponeurosis is it's basically when a flat muscle like longitudinal muscles like your biceps they insert using a tendon, right? So a, a tendon, a, a thick band, while a flat muscle, like you see here, that's a flat muscle, flat, flat muscle. All of these insert as what? As an aponeurosis rather than a tendon. So they insert as a sheet, a, sh a sheet, a sheet of connective tissue, okay? So this sheet of connective tissue is inserting the muscle into like uh, over here, your external oblique is inserting into your pelvic rim uh, and your pelvis into your linea alba. Over here, your and uh, your internal oblique is inserting into what? It's inserting into the linea alba. It's inserting into the costal margin. Uh, and lastly, our transversus abdominis, it is inserting into, again, your pelvis, your uh, costal margin, your uh, linea alba. So again, these three muscles are not inserting as tendons because they are flat muscles. They are inserting as sh a sheet of connective tissue that we call an aponeurosis. Does this make sense? Okay. Okay, so that's our. Uh, Ragad, your question is basically asking what makes an open neurosis. It's a, it's the whole connective tissue around uh, the muscle. You know, every muscle has connective tissue around it. You took it again in MSK. You're you're like if you ask me what makes a tendon, honestly, it's the connective tissue. And same thing for the epineurosis, it's the connective tissue. It's just a tendon that's flat. That's basically the idea. Uh, slide 14. When you look at slide 14, immediately you can tell. It's going from the pelvis upwards. This is an internal oblique. It's going upwards like this. The external oblique goes down, like your hands in a pocket. This one goes from your pelvis upwards, and this one goes transversely. I literally didn't even talk about the yellow landmark, so please, Yanni, yeah, just focus with me and stop thinking of everything else. I'll go through it bit by bit, and I'll go through it the way I want to go through it, and not follow the lecture. So, excuse me if this is not what you want. I'm sorry. Anyways, now, now that we build the muscles, we can go off to the next step, which is, Yanni, yeah, one of the main parts that you need to know in this lecture. Uh, the this part that talks about the layers of your abdomen. Okay, so Yanni, this is one of the easiest parts that you can think of when it comes to questions. When it comes to questions, you you will commonly be asked about. Okay, what are the layers if you cut through this area of the abdomen? This area of the abdomen. This area of the abdomen. Okay, so in general, there are multiple areas of the abdomen that you need to know how a cut would look like. So. You want to know how a cut above the umbilicus would be, below the umbilicus, very much below the umbilicus, and on the sides. Okay, so above, yeah, the first half below the umbilicus, the second half below the umbilicus, and the sides. Okay, 
So this is what I'll be trying to, you know, putting it in your mind, and hopefully it will not be that difficult. So now I just want you to look at, Yani. You know, this is again what we have been talking about. Um, these are the three muscles. Again, we said the most interior one, the interior one, the one uh, interior. So the one that's deepest is the transversus abdominis, right? It's running transversely. The one more superficial to it would be the um, so, uh, internal oblique. And the most superficial one would be the external oblique. Okay, so we have one, two, and three. Each one of these turns into an aponeurosis and inserts into the linea alba right here. So this here is the linea alba, and these three are turning into an aponeurosis and one, two, three, okay? Now, what do you need to know? You need to know that these aponeuroses, or however you say the plural of them, they act as a sheath for the rectus abdominis muscle, okay? The rectus abdominis muscle, as you can see here, it's just a slab of meat that's going straight, all right, right? So the coverings of this rectus abdominis muscle is what we call the rectus sheath. Make sense? Yeah. So the coverings of the rectus abdominis muscle is what we call the rectus sheath. Where do these com coverings come from? They come from the other abdominal wall, uh, abdominal wall muscles and their aponeuroses, all right? So their aponeurosis, as you can see here, it's just a sheet, it's just a sheet, it's just a sheet, it's just a sheet, right? It's a sheet of connective tissue that is running to the midline. And because they're running to the midline, and over here you'd have your rectus abdominis right here, so they are covering your rectus abdominis. Nothing too, nothing too complicated in this whole idea. So you have, as you can see here, this right here, this is uh, this is what you will see in the area that's like uh, right. Where's the picture of the man? Where's the picture of the man? Sorry, yeah, right here. So below the umbilicus, just below the umbilicus, right here. If you do a cut in this area, what will you be cutting? Or like a cut in this area to be more exact on the rectus abdomen itself, you will go through these uh, layers basically. So just talk about the layers of the muscles, and then we'll talk about the layers of everything else. Um, yeah. It forms in this band. Yeah, the linea alba is basically um, the yeah, any condensing together of multiple tendons and multiple yeah multiple fibrous structures, multiple fibrous structures that connect connecting together and making this linea alba. Um, So rectus abdominis and top of the aponeuroses. Not exactly. Not all of the uh, aponeuroses. Let's let's go through them one by one. So we have over here the transversus abdominis muscle. It gives off an aponeurosis, as you can see here. This is the aponeurosis, and this aponeurosis goes behind the rectus abdominis muscle. Good. That's our first aponeurosis. The transversus abdominis tra aponeurosis goes behind the rectus abdominis. Good. Now our internal oblique does a split. So it gives off two aponeuroses. As you can see here, it was even shown in this picture. So our internal oblique is giving one aponeurosis here. Then we have our rectus abdominis, then another aponeurosis, as you can see here. One, two, three. All right. So that's one aponeurosis from the internal oblique, rectus abdominis, then another aponeurosis. So the rectus abdominis is literally sandwiched between two aponeuroses of the internal oblique, okay? And then lastly, our external oblique gives off another aponeurosis, and all of these will go and attach to the linea alba, okay? So if you cut in this area, when we're talking about like the major differences that will happen, we will see that in this area right here, right here if you cut right here below the umbilicus in the first half almost you'll get these layers that we'll talk about just now but the filling the doctor mentioned oh the filling will be first the external oblique aponeurosis then the anterior lamella of the anti of the um interior internal oblique then the rectus abdominis itself 
then the posterior lamella of the internal oblique, and then the transversus abdominis muscle aponeurosis, or the aponeurosis of the transversus abdominis. Okay? So that's a cut in this area, would be like here or here. And these two together, we'll call them the anterior rectus sheath. These two together would be the posterior rectus sheath. Are we following it till now? All right. Lamella is just like half of it. As I said, the internal oblique will split into two, into two epineurosis. The epineurosis has two epineurosis. One we call the anterior lamella, the other we call the posterior lamella. Uh, is wrapped in anterior... No, it's not wrapped in them. It gives off these epineurosis. Just like a muscle ends with a tendon, this muscle ends with an epineurosis. It's just like... Think of the biceps, it has a tendon. The internal oblique also has a tendon, but its tendon is an aponeurosis. Uh, blood vessels, uh, aponeurosis, uh, yeah, probably, I think. But like, they're not, it's not really something you really need to focus on. Yeah, the IO gives two lamella, two aponeurosis, two lamella. The blood vessels that we need any yani, the main ones you will find them in the um like superficial fascia and the deeper fascia but i think yeah inside of the epineurosis you should find the blood vessels that are like related to the muscle itself i think it's over there uh yeah probably okay so this is the filling part as the doctor here mentioned it's the filling part in this area okay now it's also the filling part in here. It's going to be the filling part in here, in here, in here, in here. Like all of this, all of this and this would be, as I said, like this is the cut that we'll get. If we cut in the middle, the only difference that we'll get is that there is no rectus abdominis itself. Like the muscle itself is not there. But we will cut through the four epineuroses. Because like if we're cutting in the middle right here, there's no muscle. There's only the epineuroses, which is the linear album. Uh, how should we know if it's again please stop direct messaging me I want people to see your questions how should we know if it's in the middle or below the umbilicus what do you mean in the middle like here that's in a bit later I'll, I'll explain later for now let's just talk about the filling and I, as I said in the filling it's right here 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 okay Okay, so now we finished talking about the filling part of over here and over here. Now below this area. So over here we have something we call the arcuate line. Okay, the arcuate line is, yeah, it's something like this one over here. It's almost this one. Okay, this I think is supposed to be the arcuate line. It's like two thirds of the distance between the umbilicus and the pubic symphysis. Maybe it's over here. Maybe that's more accurate over here. But that's what we call the arcuate line. Now, what is the arcuate line and why is it significant? This is a good uh, way to visualize the arcuate line. Okay, so we were talking about the rectus abdominis, right? This is our rectus abdominis, and it's wrapped posteriorly with the, what is over here, that's our posterior lamella of the internal oblique and our transversus abdominis uh, aponeurosis. Anteriorly, we have the anterior lamella of the IO, internal oblique, and our external oblique aponeurosis, right? At this arcuate line thingy, which is, uh, yeah, it's a line that you can actually see if you dissect the person you know, well enough. What happens is basically the rectus sheath, like just stops, the posterior rectus sheath just moves anteriorly. And the rectus abdominis won't have any of the aponeuroses behind it. So both the posterior lamella and the transversus uh, abdominis fascia goes anteriorly. Okay. So basically imagine that these two were just like, they're like sheaths, sheets of paper that had a hole in them. And the rectus abdominis went through this hole. So now everything is 
of these ones are in front over here and over here is in behind. I was watching uh, which video of his was showing it and it's basically like he showed it off with this concept. So yeah, so right here, as you can see here, if they just go like this, So over here we have these two sheaths are basically our transverses and our posterior lamella. And then he puts the interior lamella and the exterior oblique. And as you can see, this is what happens. So this is how it will look like be below the arcuate line. Okay. So as you can see, it's, it's literally like this. Okay. Is this generally understood? All right, some people are saying clear, some people, okay, can you repeat? So to, Yanni, if I wanna repeat, I'll just say no. The basic idea that you need to know is that below the arcuate line, which is around two thirds of the way between the umbilicus and the pubic symphysis, below this line, these two posterior sheath components, which we said, what are the posterior sheath components? The posterior lamella and the trans and transverses abdominis muscle, aponeurosis, aponeurosis, not muscle, aponeurosis. These two just move to the front. How do they move to the front? They basically have a hole inside of them and the rectus abdominis itself goes through this hole. You can do it literally, at, Yanni, I recommend you do something exactly like he did. Use Play-Doh, use like anything, a pen, anything and just do exactly as he did in this video and you will basically understand what is happening in all of this uh yeah so it just as you can see here in this picture this is a pretty nice picture over here you have over here the rectus abdominis and the sheet the posterior sheet it has a hole in it basically and the rectus abdominis goes through the the hole and you get it i'm not going to play the video you're here to watch me like to watch me but like the video again okay so just the video itself again this is our posterior sheath. It has a hole in it and the rectus abdominis goes through it, right? And that's it. And then the two aponeuroses are on top of it. Again, while I'm re I was researching for this video, I watched this video, arcuate line, this one, and this one. Well, I'm not sure how important this one is, but these two, pretty nice. Yanni, in general, just just in general, in anatomy, I always recommend you, the first thing you do, if you don't understand something, just go to Sam Webster and search if he has a video on it, because he has a ton of them, and he saved me so many times in anatomy, uh, going forward, especially going forward. Okay, so now we finished talking about this area right here, like all of the interior part of the abdomen. Now, the sides are very easy, of course, because the sides, as you can see here, you always have your transverses abdominis muscle itself, the internal oblique muscle itself, and the external oblique muscle itself. So that's our filling in every part of the, uh, of the abdomen. Okay, that's the filling. We just did the filling. I didn't do anything about the, basically the bread on both sides, just the filling. That's uh, over here. We did it over here. We did it. Clear until now, inshallah? Oh, yes. Okay. Now let's go into the bread part. And the bread part is very easy. It's, it's very, very, very easy, actually. Um, so what do you need to know? You just need to know that the deeper part, in the deep part, we have, like, the deepest thing is the part, parietal peritoneum or the serosa, okay? That's the deepest part. After that is our extra peritoneal fat, which will house the deep vessels, okay? Any vessel that is called deep is going to be here. After that is our transversalis fascia. Now, please do not mistake the transversalis fascia for the transversus abdominis aponeurosis. These are completely different. The transversalis fascia is just your average fascia, uh, that is just, you know, it's just, it's just a fascia, a deep fascia that happens in the body. It's 
most of our body is covered with fascia and like most of the body would have a trans any uh, structure that is similar to this transverse cells fascia now if i can remember just one thing yeah the deep fascia uh, okay yeah like this deep fascia goes all the way you know, to different places like it goes around your uh like in the males it goes around the penis it goes around the scrotum it goes like to different places but like because your deep fascia just spreads basically in, in the body okay what's the difference between fibrosa and serosa what's the fibrosa i don't see any fibrosa so i'm not sure what you're asking about i just know like the peritoneal serosa or like the the parietal peritoneum um I don't know, I have a BRS open in front of me and it says deep fascia. So I'm not sure what to make of that. But like, that's how I understand it. It's basically, just name it. So don't name it deep fascia, just name it transversalis fascia. That's basically the difference I think that he's saying. It's a bit any it's a bit of a different. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, we're going from inside mostly. This is the inside. Your peritoneum is probably inside or your skin is probably outside. Anyways, so going from inside to outside, again, we have our peritoneum, the parietal peritoneum, then our extraperitoneal fat, which houses the deep, uh, the deep blood vessels. Then our transversalis fascia, which again has nothing to do with the transversus abdominis aponeurosis. Then our filling, wherever we are in the body, that's our, it depends on the, in the place, that's our filling. And then we have our superficial part, which is the scarpus fascia, which is the superficial fascia, and uh, the campers fascia, and the skin. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So basically, Aslan, yani in some books you will see people called scarpus fascia the deep fascia. Some books will call the transversalis fascia the deep fascia. It's it's a big it's a big um, like confusion in some books. So that's why we usually like to use the names given to it rather than like the descriptive name of superficial or deep. We just call it campus fascia, scarpus fascia, and transversalis fascia. Uh, so we have our campus fascia. Yeah, he was probably mentioning. Okay, so the part that the doctor was probably mentioning is coming up right now. And let me see if I can, if it makes sense. So above, we have for this part right here. So this part right here, the extraperitoneum, peritoneum, is the same everywhere in your abdomen. Okay, laterally, and medially, all of all of, all around, it is the same. This part. This part differs below and above the umbilicus. So above the umbilicus, we only have skin and just superficial fascia, and that's it. There's nothing different, like no fat and different fascia, no. It's just one form of fascia, and usually it's like uh, this fascia more than this fascia, but like in general, there's just skin and, and one layer of fascia. That is above the umbilicus. So there was a question a while ago that asked, how do you differentiate if you're above the umbilicus or below the umbilicus, that's how. Not by the filling, not by the deep parts, by the superficial parts. Above the umbilicus, you will not find um, two layers of fascia. Below the umbilicus, you will find two layers of fascia. Okay? Uh, yeah, of course. The superficial vessels are in campers fascia. If Questions about this will usually be, oh, an incision was made somewhere. Uh, for example, it will be one of two. Either an incision was made, you find these layers. Where was the incision made? A, B, C, D. Or an incision was made here. Which of the following represents the layers that you will see? A, B, C, D. Okay. One of, the, one of these two questions, basically. You need to know the layers. Okay, so again, just to make it clear.
Um, yeah, again, the questions about about this part are questions you, you can easily make by yourself, which is just where I, I just did a cut here. What's the um, what are the layers? I did a cut here. What are the layers? Other questions. I have a few other questions that I, I will ask you guys, but like questions about this concept. It's just know the concept of what are the layers of each part and that's it. Okay, so again, our as you can see here, we have the skin, campus fascia, scarpus fascia, then our filling, whatever we are, then the transverse fascia, extraperitoneal fat, and peritoneum, um, parietal peritoneum. Okay? The fat, again, uh, both fat layers are the ones that usually have the vessels. Over here, you'll find like the superficial vessels. Over here, you'll find the deeper vessels. Okay? So when the doctor mentioned that, oh, the deep fascia, there's no deep fascia, he probably was saying, you know, above the umbilicus, there is no deep fascia, which is the scarpus fascia, not the transverse fascia. The scarpus fascia is sometimes called the deep, it's literally called the deep superficial fascia, oh, fascia. And this is called the superficial superficial fascia. So, you know, it's a weird terminology, which is why, uh, we call it whatever we call it. Yeah, the aponeuroses, of course, will always be below all of this. Okay, yeah, the, the hyla will always be below all of this because the aponeuroses are parts of the filling. The filling right here is everything we talked about before we started talking about the fascia. So the muscles, the aponeuroses, all of these are the filling. All right. Uh, what two slices? The slice here and the slice here. One of them has the peritoneum, the other one has your skin. Like that's one way to, of looking at it. What is deep? One is deep, one one is superficial. That's it, Yanni. And you need to know what are the parts of each one. No problem about that, inshallah. Okay, so I think this kind of covers one of the main topics. You should know everything I said. I'm sorry, Yanni, but saying everything I said until now. Almost everything I said until now, you should know it. Like the names, these things, try to know it. Uh, and I prefer if you learn the names, like camper, scarpa, transversalis, because that's how people usually refer to it. And like, if you go and say, oh, the superficial fascia, some people understand, oh, campers, some people understand scarpas. And some people understand, oh, both of them together. So we're above the umbilicus. So just be specific and name it what it is. Camper's fascia, scarper's fascia. If you say camper's, nobody will will think anything wrong, you know? Like you you said the right thing. Or like you said the very clear distinction. Okay. Okay. Um just a small tidbit. Do you guys remember the fascia lata from MSK? Um in the lower limb. Yeah? That's a con the fascia lata is just a continuation of scarpus fascia. Scarps, yeah, scarpus fascia. It's just a continuation of it. Okay. So above the ingu uh, inguinal ligament right here, it's called scarpa. Below, it's called fascia lata. And this is what I was saying. The fascia around the body is just, it just goes everywhere. It's, it wraps around your entire body. And this is why, Yanni, um, it's Yanni, quite important to know. Okay. So. Until now, we're done with this concept, which is basically the muscles, their insertions, a bit about their functions, how to differentiate between them, the layers, and yeah, the layers above, be, below, all of that. I think we did a good job in here. Is this, Does anybody have any, any questions about this concept until now? Okay. All right. I think until now we're good. Inshallah. Okay. So this is like the main part of the lecture that I really wanted to give well. Uh, 17 and 18. 17, 18. Yeah, they're the same. They look the same. Yeah. And over here, the doctor, I don't know why, but he, like, this, this slide really triggered me because, like, this, the cut is kind of above the umbilicus, yet he so shows two layers. Which it should be one layer here, to be honest. Um, so I really don't know, Yanni, what to say. 
about this one. But like, I checked so many resources and all of the resources said, above the umbilicus, you don't have two layers, you have one layer. So I'll just, I don't know what to say about this one, honestly. Uh, yeah. Fascia before and above the umbilicus, you mean? Okay. Uh, if you would like to take a small five minutes for Salah, tell me. Until now, for this part, you just need to know the layers. Like, just go, all right, over here. If I cut here, what do I find? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. If I cut here, what do I find? If I cut below the arcuate, above the arcuate, above the umbilicus, in the middle, in the midline, a bit laterally, in the lateral side, just know each one of them, what you will find. Or just understand the concept and you can build it during the exam. Yeah, above the umbilicus, you will have skin and superficial fascia. It's not camper and scarpa, it's just called superficial fascia. The arcuate line area again is this right here. Do you see this? We mentioned here where like the rectus abdominis goes through the posterior uh, sheath. This right here is what we call the arcuate line. Uh, which layer isn't present above? Okay, just give me a second. There's a question which which layer isn't present above the umbilicus. Now, let me just make sure of this one if I can find it. Uh, right here. So, above the umbilicus, the superficial fascia is composed of a single sheet of fatty connective tissue. Okay, so above the umbilicus, there's just fatty connective tissue. It's not called capper's fascia. It's not called camper's fascia. It's called superficial fascia. That is mainly fat. Okay, please make sure because camper's fascia is only below the umbilicus, not above. Even though it's basically the same thing, just don't use the wrong terminologies because anatomists, the only thing they're good for is terminology. I'm sorry. Okay. Now, uh, okay, so we're done with this part. Now, I want to go up. Now, at the start of the lecture, the doctor talks about this a lot. And I want to talk about it, but I want to talk about it in a better diagram. So let me just look for the book right here. Okay, so this is BRS. Uh, yeah, this is BRS. It's a pretty nice book. You can easily find it. Uh, yeah, you can easily find it. I literally just searched BRS Anatomy PDF and like, found the, f the first one and I opened it. So I don't think I need to send you this. But over, where, where is the image that I want to show? It's page, yeah, page 190, right here. Okay. So this image right here is what the doctor was talking about over here, but like this is a bit more clear. This is you know, what he's talking about right here. There are six folds he mentioned. One, two, three, four, five, and six. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six. All right, we call them folds, we call them ligaments. Both of these, you will find them in different books. So it's fine to call them a ligament, it's fine to call it a fold. I prefer fold because it's not really a ligament, um, except the falciform ligament. So what are these? Yeni, the main thing you should know is what each of them will contain. So let's start with the median umbilical cord, uh, umbilical fold. The median umbilical fold, all right, is as you can see here it basically goes from your bladder to the umbilicus and this is a remnant of an embryologic structure that you will learn later it was called the arachis okay so it was basically a structure that connects your bladder to your umbilicus okay and of course after you're born the structure is destroyed and the remnant of it is called the median umbilical fold okay so it connects what to what the bladder to the umbilicus uh, this is both in males and females. Doesn't matter. It's, it happens in both males and females. Now, we have another structure over here. Just wait a bit and you'll see it. Okay, we have another structure over here that's going from the umbilicus down over here and over here. Okay, this is what we call the medial umbilical fold. The medial umbilical fold is a remnant of what? 
of the umbilical arteries. So when you were a fetus, you had two arteries and one vein, umbilical, one, two umbilical arteries, one umbilical vein. The two umbilical arteries were going like this, as you can see here, and they would run almost to your internal iliac. Remnant baqiyya, baqaya. So like what remains of something, that's a remnant. Um, yeah, so the medial umbilical fold is the remnant of your, what? Of your umbilical arteries. So we have two medial umbilical folds. Why? Because we used to have two umbilical arteries. And that's why they're both going where? Going to your umbilicus. Okay. La lastly, we have these two lateral umbilical folds. These ones will house what? They house, as he said here, the lateral umbilical fold will contain the deep, uh, uh, the deep inferior epigastric vessels. So it's epigastric, but going from below. And as you can see here, there is a good image that he drew here. As you can see here, this is um, your aorta, uh, your external iliac artery, and it gives off a branch. This branch over here is your deep, your deep inferior. So it's deep. And it's coming from the da from down, so it's inferior, and it goes all the way up to your epigastric area. So it's a deep inferior epigastric vessel. Okay, and this where does it run? It runs in the lateral umbilical fold. It goes all the way up over here. Okay. Uh, so where does this run? This runs over here in your deep extraperitoneal fat. That's the vessels that that's one of the vessels that are running over here. Okay. And lastly, the last question, the last point is the falciform ligament. Now, what someone asked, isn't the falciform ligament in the, in the liver? Well, yeah, it, it connects all the way over here. So it goes all the way and it covers, goes around the liver. Now, what do you know about the falciform ligament? Can anybody tell me what do they know about it real quick? It separates the liver, right? It's a remnant of the umbilical vein. It isn't a remnant of the umbilical vein. It is what it's not a remnant. It houses the remnant. It contains inside of it the ligamentum teres hepatis. And the ligamentum teres hepatis is the remnant of the umbilical vein. OK? Uh, this is yeah. You know, this is some of the few stuff that I just I still remember from that part, which is yeah. So the falciform ligament is going from the umbilicus towards your liver, and it it separates it to right and left lobe. And uh, yeah, so it it goes right and left lobe, and inside of it is your ligamentum teres hepatis, which is I believe the remnant of the umbilical. Vein. Uh, please correct me if I'm if you think I'm wrong. I I think. I'm right from like the stuff I was studying. Someone was asking me about the ventral mesentery. Like, I'm sorry, but I'm not giving a lecture about the peritoneum, and I really did not prepare for the peritoneum. So I can't really give you a good answer about what the ventral mesentery is right now. If you ask me later, uh, I am in fourth year. If you ask me later, I might, Yanni, uh, like research it a bit and give you an answer. But right now, I really can't give you a good answer about this one. Okay, so that's just what he was talking about in this slide, which is the six folds and what each of the, one of them represents. Okay, now over here he does a, a bit of a thing where he just starts cutting up and telling you, oh, when you cut up this, you can see this. You can cut up this, you can see that. Is that an animal? What's the, oh, my? Yeah, I have a bird. He is tweeting. All right. Okay, so. Now, uh, we did, yeah, so we did a lot of, uh, we did the part about the folds, we did the part of the folds, uh, the part about the inferior epigastric, uh, deep inferior epigastric, we talked about the muscles, hey, don't call him annoying, I love him, um, and as you can see here, we talked about transfusion, now, just, just something to note 
that if anybody tells you, okay, where, like, this is a question. I'll give you this question. This is a question that might come as an exam question. Okay. Where in the abdomen, all right, where in the abdomen will the rectus abdominis muscle be directly, like, directly behind of it, the transversalis fascia? Okay. Where in the abdominal wall will you find that behind posterior to the erectus abdominis, immediately the transversalis fascia? Below the arcuate line, below the arcuate line. Yeah, it's below the arcuate line. As it's seen right here. So right here, he drew the transversalis fascia and behind the rectus abdominis, immediately the transversalis fascia. So the question again is where in the abdomen uh, there is like don't think about a b and c like just where below the abdomen will you find directly posterior to the rectus abdominis the transversalis fascia and that would be again as they said below the arcuate line because below the arcuate line you'll have this image right here there's no posterior sheath it's immediately the transversalis fascia the transversalis fascia cool cool great okay uh now Okay. Uh, as you can see here, we have a deep inferior epigastric artery. So, of course, we'll have. Uh, is arc line making ninety degrees? No, it's uh the the word arcuate means it's uh, curved. It's a curved line. So it's doing like this basically. It's it's basically this, but a bit above. So like whoa, right there. No, no, don't worry about it. I'm uh, just. Don't worry about it. You take me too seriously, people. Okay. Uh, where are we right now? So does anybody have any questions for now? Because the next concept we want to talk about real quick is the conjoint tendon. And then I think I'll go to the inguinal ligaments. Uh, above the umbilicus. Above the umbilicus, you only have the fatty layer. Crystal is just, uh, the bird is just resting now. Don't worry about it. So, any questions until now or no? All good. Okay. Now, there's the concept of the <laughs> conjoint tendon. So, like, okay. Uh, the silly concept of the conjoint tendon. Now, I... Okay, so what's the conjoint tendon, you ask? And I don't know. The conjoint tendon... It's something that he keeps mentioning, and he over here says, "Oh, what what will definitely have a conjoint tendon?" Now, the conjoint tendon is basically okay. So, if we go over here, I guess this is a good place to show it. Yeah. So, uh, how do I want to? See that? What's a good picture for this? I can't find a good picture. God damn it! Just give me a second. I'm sorry about this. I think yeah, this is a decent picture over so many pictures. I guess it's an anatomy lecture. I think this is it, Asan. Awesome. Yeah, this is it. Oh yeah, he drew it already. Okay, <laughs> okay, and I was looking for it. So the conjoint tendon is just the idea that the internal oblique muscle, okay, the internal oblique. So over here we have the internal oblique, this one, this one right here, and our, um, transversus abdominis muscle, these two together, when they are inserting medially, okay, yani over here, not to the linea alba, like over here, when they're ascending here, they join together to form one tendon. Which ones? The internal and the transverse. These two make one tendon and insert together. And this tendon is called the conjoined tendon. Okay? That's... All it is. Don't, يعني, don't try to overcomplicate it or anything. It's just that's what a conjoint tendon is. Now, let me see if I can find it in my book. Yeah, right here. So, it is formed by the aponeurosis of the internal oblique and the transverse muscles of the abdomen and is inserted into where? Into the pubic crest. Uh, where is it? Okay. In the pubic tubercle and pubic crest. So, right here. 
Pubic tubercle, pubic crest. Strengthens the posterior wall of the inguinal canal. We'll mention that later. So yeah, the yellow thing over here that you see is the conjoint tendon. Do you know now what the conjoint tendon is? So answer this real quick. Which of the following decisions will definitely go through the conjoint tendon? Definitely go through it. E, because it will go over here. I think until now we're doing well. That's our conjoint tendon. Okay. The conjoined tendon is again, what is it? It is the it's basically you have both the internal oblique and the transversus muscle. They merge together, their aponeuroses merge together and um, insert into the pubic tubercle and the pubic crest. And that's it. That's what the conjoined tendon is. It's also called the falx inguinalis. You don't need to know that one because I don't know it either. E is not the arcuate line. E is, um, I think, just the pelvis, uh, like the pubis, the pubis line, basically. So, any or like the outline of the pubis. So, as long as you cut all around the pubis, you will definitely hit the conjoint tendon. You can search for the other name online, Falx inguinalis or something, or like in the book. Right here. I'm just using this book again. Where is it? Did I not open it? BRS, yeah. I, just, I, I literally have the book open in front of me and I'm reading through it a bit. Right here, it says this is the part about the conjoint tendon. Again, BRS anatomy is really good when you just want to know certain structures. What are, where are they? Because it just tells you, okay, this structure, blah, 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 blah. Next. Okay. Um, Sorry if I'm like all over the place, but literally this this lecture is all over the place. So I really don't know how it is organized. I don't study for, uh, I never used books like as my main source of studying in first year, uh, but I use BRS anatomy and BRS physiology as like supplements because they are they're literally called board review series so they're made for reviews they're not made for studying them i just use them because like oh if i need something real quick i find it over there but right now i think amboss also does the job really well and the best thing about brs is uh where is okay did i just go way too much no way is the questions at the end of each chapter they have really good questions Especially for physiology. Oh, really good questions. Uh, questions outside of the anterior abdominal wall, I'll answer them later. Right now, let's just focus on the anterior abdominal wall. Okay, now we're talking about the inguinal canal, or inguinal canal, or whatever you want to call it. And this is a whole different mess. Okay, now why do we talk about it? Let's just start really simple. We're talking about the anterior abdominal wall. Why the hell? Do we want to talk about our inguinal area? Why the hell are we talking about the scrotum in the anterior abdominal wall? Does it make sense? It does. Why? Because the scrotum is technically just an outpouching of the anterior abdominal wall. Okay? So literally, the anterior abdominal wall just outpouches outwards and makes your scrotum. So the scrotum will have almost all the layers of the anterior abdominal, anterior abdominal wall, including the peritoneum. There's literally peritoneum around your testes if you're a man and around your ovaries if you're a woman, technically. So because like when you're a fetus, when you're a baby, the gonads start like in the abdomen or like, yeah, they're, they start paraortic in the abdomen near your kidneys and they descend. If you're a female, they descend just a bit to reach your pelvis if they if you're a male they go all the way to your scrotum okay so this is why we're taking the whole idea about the inguinal canal and the scrotum and whatever in the anterior abdominal wall because it's very connected okay you will study this again later but see any i'm just giving you like the concept of why we do uh, why you're studying this and then we'll talk about it just a bit okay so our inguinal ligament now our inguinal uh, uh, the rectus abdominis is an uh, exception, definitely. You don't have the rectus abdominis in your scrotum. No, we messed up. Um, 
what uh, can you repeat can you repeat so again i'm i'm just saying that the reason you study uh the scrotum in the structure is because your scrotum has almost the same layers as your anterior abdominal wall why does that happen it's because when your testis if you're a man of course when your testis is going down towards your scrotum it basically takes with it all the layers of the abdomen just takes them with it and it goes all the way to your uh no, this mean I still didn't start the inguinal ligament to relax. I didn't even talk about it yet. Let's go with the inguinal ligament. Bismillah. So what's our inguinal ligament? Okay. Now let's talk about how this inguinal ligament aslan is formed. Because the inguinal lig ligament is very, very unique between other ligaments. It's not simply just oh to uh, like a fibrous structure going from one side to the next. Okay. In actuality. And take this, okay? The inguinal ligament over here, what, where is it coming from? The doctor even like drew it right here. And it's a pretty nice drawing over here. Where is it? Yeah, right here. As you can see here, this is what? Which muscle is this? Or which epineurosis is this would be? This is uh, sagittal. Yeah, sagittal. External oblique. Yeah, that's our external oblique, right? So look at it over here. It's going down, 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 and then it does a U-turn. This U-turn right here, this is your inguinal ligament. Okay? So this thing, you see how it's it's always drawn as a U-turn. That's because you would see right here, that's your external oblique going down and does a U-turn. And makes this canal type of, or like, yeah, makes something that looks like a canal. Okay. Is this like understood? Great. So if anybody asks you what's, what makes your inguinal canal, it's your external oblique muscle. External oblique muscles makes your inguinal canal. Great, fantastic. Now, or like your inguinal ligament, sorry, your inguinal ligament. I know this lesson is hard. I know it's hard. But just follow with me, and uh, you can watch the video later. Again, it's recorded, alhamdulillah. But for now, let's just go through it. Inshallah, it will work out. Okay, so now we have this canal. And over here, the doctor marked a few areas. It, this is your ASIS, because it starts from here. Or ASIS. This is, I think, your tubercle, your, and this is your lacunar ligament. This is the one of the things, and this is the symphysis. This is one of the pubic stuff, and this is the pubic symphysis. So symphysis, tubercle, uh, lacu no, pectineal, and your ASIS. Cool. Now we have something called the deep inguinal ring. And what is this? Just someone please tell me. What is this? The DIE? Come on, guys. Deep inferior epigastric. Yes. Good, good, great, fantastic. Uh, if you want to know what three is, just go to this slide again. It's right here. Th four. It's four here. It's your pubic crest. That's three here. That's the pubic crest, pubic tubercle, pubic symphysis, ASIS, pectineal line. The IE is your um, deep epigastric uh, vessel, inferior epigastric vessel. These are your rectus abdominis, of course. And lastly, we have our DIR. Our DIR is our deep inguinal ring. Or inguinal ring. I don't know how to say this. Even though I listened to like three videos. Okay, so our deep inguinal ring. Great. Uh, what is our deep inguinal ring? Now, let's go up a bit. And we will see our deep inguinal ring. Right. I think this. No, not this. Uh, no, not this. Let's go to that one image he has right here. Yeah. So over here. If you put this and let's just go back here and, and see over here, we had our, as you can see here, the deep inguinal ring right here and just uh, medial to it, just a bit medial to it was the vessels, right? So if you look right here, this is our vessel, the DIE, the deep inferior epigastric. And right here, you see a lot of vessels coming out of it. Right? Like there's a lot of structures coming out of this one right here. This is our deep ring. Okay? Now this here 
is our deep inguinal ring. Now, what is the deep inguinal ring, you may ask, and that's a very good question. The deep inguinal ring is simply a defect, a hole in the transversalis fascia, okay? So the transversalis fascia, we talked about it, right? It is right been behind, posterior to the filling, right? This one. It covers your entire abdomen. And in this small area, you will find that it has basically an opening or it has like an opening you can go through, okay? Now, why do we have this opening to go through? Because again, your testes needs to go to your scrotum. It needs to migrate from your abdomen to your scrotum in, outside of your body, right? So if it's inside of your abdomen, what's, what is scrotum? The scrotum is, uh, do you not know what a scrotum is? Uh, it's uh, your, the thing that holds your testes. Ball sack. Thank you, Sammy. That's a way to say it. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> Why am I laughing? So, yeah. So, it's your testes needs to go from your abdomen to your scrotum. Your scrotum is outside of the peritoneal cavity, outside of your abdominal cavity. So, it needs to migrate. Uh, all of these layers, basically, it needs to go through these layers that we were just talking about just to go outside and go down to your testes, to your scrotum. And to do that, we have this first step, which is the deep ring. The deep ring, basically, you have the transversalis fascia right here. Your testes would be over here, and it will go through this hole that's in the fascia. And through this hole, it will enter the inguinal canal over here. So it will go through the hole. This hole is made inside of what? The transversalis fascia and go over here. Okay? Is this until now understood? All right. That's lovely. So that's the first part. Now it will move in this ligament. The testis will move in this ligament and it as you can see here right here this is the route it will take it will loop in this ligament and will exit over here over here we have another ring that we call this ring this triangle-ish -ish shaped ring we call it our superficial inguinal ring okay so we have a deep one that it enters from and a superficial one that it exits from because of course it's going from deep to superficial because it wants to exit outside of the body so our again where is our deep one located it's located inside of the transversus fascia or the transversalis fascia which is this one and our superficial one is where the superficial one is in the aponeurosis of the external oblique muscle yes sir the aponeurosis of the external oblique muscle this is the aponeurosis and we have a defect inside of it and it's going from it. As you can see here, this is our external oblique and this small bit right here. And you have the whole scrot uh, the whole uh, testes and its vessels and everything going out from here. And it's just a picture that's showing you right here. It, it, he's telling you, oh, this is the deep inguinal ring, the superficial one. And you over here, you have the testes. Woo! Now, what are the structures passing? Uh, sometimes they will ask you about the structures. Uh, sometimes they will ask you about the structures. Uh, sorry about that. Just a direct message that I had to answer. Um, what batch am I? I'm 11th batch. Can you like leave the tarf lebadain? God. Anyways, uh, what were we talking about? Yeah, we were talking about the this thingy, this thingy, this thingy. Okay. Okay, so what were we saying? We we're saying this is basically an image that shows it. We have the testicles. They are going from the deep ring to the superficial ring. 
and they are going to towards your scrotum. Cool. That's how it happens in males, of course. Uh, the superficial ring is in the external oblique oponeurosis, while the um, deep one is in the transversalis fascia. Okay. So what are these rings? They are basically just Uh, so what are these rings? It's basically just openings for the testicles, your gonads, if you're a man, of course, to go through so they can reach the scrotum. Uh, the, yeah, the deep fascia, the transversalis fascia, the transversalis fascia. I kept saying transversalis fascia and not deep fascia just to avoid this confusion because this is the transversalis fascia and there's no other transversalis fascia. And this is the scarpa and this is the capra. Okay, now when we're talking about a female, there are like stuff that we know. Let's just finish talking about the inguinal canal first, and then we'll talk about all oh, differences between females and males and everything. Okay, uh, what were we talking about? Is there any any questions that anybody has like specifically right now? Anything the doctor said that you find confusing that is still confusing until now? Uh, did the did the doctor mention uh, the Hasselbach triangle? I think he mentioned it. Hasselbach triangle was over here in the he did okay so I'll mention the Hasselbach factor in the in a bit I guess yeah yeah okay perfect. let me just continue okay um so we have one other thing that I wanted to mention over here it's okay so when we're talking about the okay let's just finish talking about this yeah I just remembered okay so the testicles when they're going from your abdomen to your scrotum right? If you're a man. I'm sorry for females if this is uh, awkward. Uh, so when they're going, they don't just go by themselves. They need their blood vessels, they need their nerves, they need lymphatics to come with them, and they need the duct that will take the semen, the sperm, from your testes and send it basically to where they should go, which is your uh, urethra, your uh, seminal viscous, whatever. Yeah? Okay, cool. Um... So yeah, so they're taking your uh, so your sperms are created in your testes, right? And you need to send them through this duct. This duct is what we call the vas deferens. Now all of these things are contained in one structure that we call the spermatic cord, right? This is the spermatic cord. The spermatic cord. What does it contain? It contains uh, the testicular blood vessels, the testicular. Uh, nerves. I don't remember the exact name of the nerve. I think it's the ilioinguinal nerve, maybe. Uh, genital. Uh, uh, yeah, the genital branch, I think, or the testicular nerve. One of them. Maybe the testicular nerve. Uh, so it has that nerve. It has lymphatics. It has vessels, and it has the vas deferens, which is the duct that is sending the sperm towards your urethra or whatever. Okay. All of these are contained in your spermatic cord if you're a male of course and the spermatic cord is running in the inguinal canal cool and basically going from your oh god sorry from your deep ring to the superficial ring down your scrotum if you're a male again so all of these is what the contents in are in a male is this clear Uh, great. No love. <laughs> right. So what? Uh, yeah. So in females, there's a different thing that happens. In females, you will find something called the round ligament in the inguinal canal. This is what you will find in females, the round ligament. Now, I can explain to you what the hell is a round ligament is. It's it's a very fascinating topic, and I honestly love explaining it, but it is 
yani much more difficult or it's not easy to understand right now you'll understand it very well when you come to the repro block inshallah if you have a good doctor with you you'll understand what it is in repro no problem but like right now just trust me when if anybody asks you oh what is there in the inguinal canal for females just tell them the round ligament of the uterus and if someone asks you okay what does it connect it connects the uterus of the female to the labia majora which is the skin part of her genitals her external genitals okay if anybody if that's just for you to know right now again if somebody asks you because it they actually once they did ask us uh in the oski and jit about uh, the contents of the inguinal canal for females and so you needed to know what's a uh, yeni that it has what it has something called the round ligament of the uterus and what's the round ligament of the uterus it's a ligament that connects the uterus to the labia majora what is the labia majora it is the skin part of the external genitals of the female if you want pictures sure but i will not show pictures because this will be put on youtube um the males have a remnant of this round ligament inside of their scrotum and again, when you reach repro, you will understand this much, much better. Or if you want, just ask me after the lecture and I will show you a bit, a bit about it. But just know uh, it's inside of the inguinal canal. So the content of the inguinal canal, the contents of the inguinal canal in the female, round ligament. The contents of the inguinal canal in males, spermatic cord, which contains nerves, vessels, and uh, your vas deferens. Cool? Very cool. All right, so now again, so this is the idea of the deep ring and the superficial rings. Um, now, as I said, Yanni, when, when your testicles is going down and I have a picture in BRS, I guess, a good picture about it. Oh God, why did I go so down? Sorry guys, give me a second. I should have just downloaded this, I'm stupid. Sorry. Okay, so. Round ligament of uterus. Yeah, that's the best way to say it. Because like, apparently there's another round ligament that I don't know of. Yeah. So uh, as I was saying, I was telling you guys, in, oh, it has like the same, as you can see here, this is your, uh, this is like the testicle. Apparently I do have a picture of the testicle. Cool. So, and as you can see, here, it just goes down. And with it, it takes, as you can see here, it took part of the internal oblique right here. It's going. Part of the external oblique right here. It's going. Part of the peritoneum itself, it's right around it. And yeah, so it takes parts of these muscles, all the muscles except the transversus uh, abdominis, as you can see here. It's wrapping around the testicles. And like, uh, if anybody, like men, I think the people should know, uh, like most men know that, especially in these times of cold, uh, something happens, uh, especially when you're really cold in your scrotum, right? It basically tenses up. And that's because you have muscles there. You have the cremastic muscle, which is derived from your internal oblique. That one tenses it up and basically pulls. Tense, like shiddo, not tennis, tense, you should. Okay, so this is just uh, like, oh, cute fact. You, I, I think you'll take this again, repro. Repro is the main part we'll be talking about this. Um, okay. Now he talks a bit now about mainly the hernias. I think that's the last part that's important. Hernias. Let me just see again. So we talked about the deep inferior epigastric artery. We talked about the inguinal canal. We talked about the erectus sheath. We talked about the conjoined tendon. We talked about, again, deep inferior, okay. And now we're off to Hasselbach triangle and the whole point about uh, hernias, cool. We talked about these four. Um, we talked about the abdominis, the layers. Okay, cool, cool. So I think our last part is the... So over here, just, just one point, because I was just mentioning right here. Uh, where's the image again? God damn it. Where's it? Oh, yeah. I was mentioning right here, right? The peritoneum is right here. And basically, when you're a baby, it, it closes, right? Uh, 
So if it stays open, the fluid of the peritoneum will go and fill up the sac right here. So the fluid from the peritoneum will go over here. And that's where you get something like this, which is a lot of fluid inside of the scrotum, as you can see here. So it's just full of fluid because it's taken fluid from peritoneum. And that's something we call a hydrocele. This is a real picture, and I've seen uh, a similar case in the hospital like three weeks ago. Uh, again, the uh, if you need like, uh, yeah, it glows if you put like light into it because water, like it will spread around. It's just water. It's just literally water. So it transluminates. Is there peritoneum in the scrotum? Technically, yes. Technically. Uh, someone was asking Gaben about the uh, conjoined tendon and it's the yellow over here. It is the joining, again, of the internal oblique and the transverses abdominis. They join together and they make this yellow thing over here and it goes down over here. That's your conjoined tendon. Uh, if you squeeze, does it help? <laughs> well, for five seconds, then it will fill up again. That's not how you treat a hydrocele. Usually, don't treat it. Unless it's very severe, then you like just close it uh, in surgery. You do surgery. The water goes there again. If you look at this picture, this is your peritoneum, right? This is your peritoneum and it's full of fluid. And your testes go from your abdomen and goes over here and then closes the peritoneum behind it. So if do a birth defect, there's a birth defect that leaves the peritoneum open, the whole um, water or like the fluid of the peritoneum will just go over here and it will fill up the sac. No, you don't uh, pen and bro no, you do not do not do that, Sammy. Please do not do that. Uh, and the last someone was asking what muscles again? Just look at it right here. The muscles are the internal, the and the external. The internal and the external will go in with their epineurosis, not the transverses. That's part part. Not the trans uh, uh, not the the transverse sal transverse abdominis. This one like just makes that ring. The rest goes down and make the chromatic muscle. Okay. Um, no, I don't think so, Sammy. I don't think so because there is no reason for the peritoneum to outpouch if the ovaries are not going outside of the peritoneum. Uh, yeah, you know, the ovaries literally inside of your peritoneum. Like why would it go out? Doesn't make any sense, right? Okay, uh, so hernias. Let's talk about hernias. The peritoneum covers the uterus from above, not below, just from above. It's called a, a infraperitoneal structure, the uterus. Didn't you take this? You took the peritoneum. It's literally mentioned. Um, yeah, hernias, inguinal hernias. So we'll mainly talk about the inguinal hernias. Okay, so um, we have two main types of hernias that we should talk about when we talk about the inguinal hernia. Now, there's a lot of uh, different types of hernias that you will study through the years, or not really, but the main ones you need to know about is the inguinal hernia. And the inguinal hernia has two types, either the direct or the indirect hernia, okay? The direct hernia is the one that happens through the Hesselbach triangle. The indirect hernia happens through the inguinal canal. Okay, and now let's just talk about this more in detail. So let's start with the direct hernia because, oh, the name direct, more cool, I guess. The, the Hesselbach triangle. So the Hesselbach triangle is an anatomical area that has, it's a triangle. And as you can see here, what are its borders? So medially, you have the rectus abdominis muscle or what we call the le the border of it, the lateral border, we call it the linea semilunaris, uh, okay? So it's just the lateral part of the uh, rectus abdominis. Please do not mistake this for the femoral triangle. The femoral triangle is something else. The femoral triangle is like right here, I think, down here. We are talking about the Hesselbach triangle. 
So its medial border is the linea similunaris, okay, which is the lateral the lateral side of the rectus abdominis, as you can see. Its floor or its inferior border is what the inguinal canal. Cool. The med the lateral border is the epigastric, the deep inferior epigastric vessels. One, two, three. So this triangle right here is a bit of a weak spot in your abdomen. Okay, so it doesn't have like that strong of muscles or up in your OCCs over here. For some reason or another, it's much more weaker over here. Okay, and so stuff inside of your bowels, so like you're literally your bowels, your intestines, can just jump out of the peritoneum or like not inside, out of the peritoneum, but like they can herniate. They can jump out and basically go through this Hesselbach triangle. Okay, and this is what a hernia is when we're talking about whatever this is. So yeah, through the Hesselbach triangle, they just go. Okay, so if I can find like a decent picture, um, direct hernia. Um, yeah, no, 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 that's an indirect hernia. Yeah, that's an inguinal indirect. Is there no good picture for a direct hernia? Sorry, guys, didn't prepare for this one clearly. Uh, yeah, so something like this. So basically, um, basically the idea is your bowels, the loop of bowel, will just go through this Hasselbeck triangle and will basically like pop out. Uh, and you'll see, like, the person who has a hernia will see, oh, there's something in my skin that's going out. And usually when they cough, the part of the bowel will go out a bit more. And the bowels, when I say bowel, I mean intestines. So part of your intestines, your intestines are basically coming out. I think this is, like, very understandable. Um, yeah, so that's our direct hernia. Okay? Uh, is this clear? Clear, 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 clear. Great. So this is clear. That's our direct hernia. Okay. Now, if you want to know what is like, okay, so a direct hernia, where do you expect to see it? Just from what I, ex uh, what I explained until now, where do you expect to see a direct hernia? Oh, like in, uh, in what kind of people, sorry, sorry, not where, like location, in what kind of people do you expect to see uh, a direct hernia? Older, fat, females, children. Okay, so this is a very good point. Females. So yes, this can have. This happens way more in females than an indirect one because of what we will explain later. So yeah, females one. Older people usually two, because they they have a weaker abdominal wall. What's important to know is that you usually see it in not babies. Anything other than a baby. In a baby, you will see an indirect one much more, like in a newborn. Yeah, indirect. In anything after being a newborn, so like a year after birth, two years, three years, two dying, you will usually see um, a, in a, a direct hernia like a Hasselbeck triangle. And again, you it's basically a mass that will usually like increase in size when you cough or when you like try to defecate, poop, whatever you want to call it. Like when you stress, you, you uh, the mass will increase in size. Now, on the other hand, we have our indirect hernias and our indirect hernias are basically, so you heard everything I've been explaining about the testes, right? The testicles, how they go from your abdomen through your deep ring and then to the superficial ring and then go to the scrotum, right? Yes, yes, yes. You hear, okay. All of that is exactly what happens with an indirect hernia, but replace the word testicle with, with small intestine. And that's it. So as you can see here, please I put weight. As you can see here, this is, uh, I think it's an example of, yeah, this is an example of a hernia right here. And just like the testicle is going right here, the bowel is going right here with it. So it goes from the deep ring through the canal to the superficial ring. Does this make sense? Is this any simple 
or anything. So over here, this is a decent picture actually of what we have here. So here we have our direct and our indirect. Um, so we have a direct and an indirect, okay? And our direct, as you can see here, it's not going through the deep ring. It's not going like the testicle. It's not going anything. It's just going through a different part, which is probably the hesapac triangle, as you can see here. In an indirect one, it goes just like the testes goes through the deep ring and then the superficial ring of blah, blah, blah. You have our thingy over here, the, what is it called? Safrullah. The bowels, any small intestines, and it just goes like this and goes over here. Okay? Does this make sense at all to anybody? Yes, 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 yes. Great. Thank you. Um, in both of them, in both of them, you'll have loops of your intestine, your bowels going out. And they're basically any um, covered in peritoneum, of course. They'll be covered in peritoneum, but they will be just leaving the abdominal cavity and going outside towards the muscles, like after outside of the muscle. Okay. In females, it is very, very, very rare for an indirect hernia to happen because yes, they do have like kind of, they do have a deep ring and a superficial ring. They kind of have it because of the round ligament. Again, they kind of need it. They kind of have it, but it's not large. It's very small. And it's very difficult for you to like imagine a whole part of your intestines going through a very small ring. Okay. No, in direct hernias, this is a direct hernia. This is an indirect hernia. In a direct hernia, there is no way it is going through the rings. The direct hernia goes next to the ring in the Hasselbach triangle. And the Hasselbach triangle, as you can see here, this is the Hasselbach triangle. This is the ring. So it's going through here, not through the ring. Okay? That's a direct hernia goes through the Hasselbach triangle. In the indirect hernia, it will go through the deep inguinal ring, run in the thingy right here in the inguinal canal, go through the superficial, and go to the scrotum. So usually what we will find is basically a mass in the scrotum that enlarges whenever the baby coughs. So if the baby coughs, ho, ho, you see that, oh, the scrotum is enlarging suddenly. Okay, what is this? This is probably an indirect hernia going to your scrotum. Okay, and this is why this is important because like you might either have a hydrocele, which is just water, this is no problem, or you might have a whole part of your intestines in your scrotum, which might like just get strangulated and your intestines might start to die out because like there's it's getting strangulated inside of your scrotum. And so it's very important when a, a baby presents to you with an enlarged scrotum is this Hydrocele, so just water, no problem. Or is this a full-on intestine? Can both intestine and water go there? Yeah, sure, it can. But like, if that happens, you really don't care about water. It's like, oh god, I have an intestine inside. Inside, that's bad. If you have water inside, who cares? Um, so, so that's the whole part about the hernia. So our indirect, our direct hernias. Are they clear enough to everyone, inshallah? Yes, 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 yes. Can you repeat again? Uh, okay, so just if you want a very quick summary of direct and direct hernia, direct hernia goes through Hasselbach triangle. More, it happens after birth. And you will see it like in the, like in the lower abdomen. The indirect hernia goes through the deep ring, superficial ring, goes down to the scrotum. It happens usually at birth, and you will see it inside of the scrotum, and that's it. So yeah, uh, I think right now um, the lecture is done. In from like what I want to say, that's basically everything I wanted to say. Now I have a few questions in this book. You can either like download the book and you can find the questions, or you can like just right now you can wait for me to do them with you guys if you want. 
Uh, and if anybody has any, so I'm just trying right now to finish this so that we can stop the recording. And then everybody, if anybody has any questions, they can ask me and we will not close the place until everybody is finished with their questions. Because I did see a lot of questions. I'm like waiting for it. Indirect happens at birth. At birth, they have indirect. Direct happens after birth. So, so maybe it's two-year-old. Maybe it's a two-year-old baby, but they have a direct. Indirect usually happens like at birth or like in the first year of life. Okay, one. All right, so let's do the questions first. And then any other uh, question anybody has, I will answer them after we cut off the uh, recording. Is that good? Is that fine with everyone? Just find the damn questions. Why are they so down, 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 down? Where are the questions? It's in page two, two, six, five? No, two, two, three, thirty. Damn, where am I? Ooh, okay, just give me a second. I'll find the questions. Sorry, guys. All right, let's just real quick let's to, to, to look at the questions right here. So one of the questions is this right here. A two-year-old boy presents with pain in his groin that has been increasing in nature over the past few weeks. He is found to have a degenerative malformation of the transversalis fascia during development. Okay, so he has a problem in his transversalis fascia. Which of the following structures is likely defective? He has a problem in his transversalis fascia. What is the structure that is probably in a problem? B, 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 B. Yeah, it's B. Because the deep inguinal ring is a part or like a hole inside of the transversalis fascia. As we mentioned again over uh, here. So it's part of... Where is it? Yeah, it's part of this. So it's part of this, that's the transversalis fascia. And it is, if you see this picture, it is right this. So all of this, you see the transversalis fascia and it's right this, this is our deep ring. That's one question. Uh, let me see if where the other questions were, because this is like the entirety of the abdomen. So it has GIT, it has renal, it has everything. Um, it's fight ductus, vagus. Coastal sending. I, I do apologize for this. I'll find it. He is right here. Kristen? That's him. Kristen? P fact? All right. This is a question over here. Uh, his name is Crystal. Uh, so we have a pediatric surgeon has resected a structure that is a fibrous remnant of an embryonic artery in a five-year-old child. Which of the following structures is most likely to be divided? It's a fetal or embryonic artery. Which one is it? The medial umbilical fold. It is a, f uh, it is a remnant of the umbilical artery. Cool, cool. Uh, let me see if I can find another one. Um, where is the, uh, where are we? Straining by the system, middle colic artery, sonic artery. It was right, I think this one. Uh, no. So, uh, the, for this question, it, Yeni, basically I explained all of it, but the, uh, the median umbilical fold, the median is something called the arachis, uh, which is something that connects your bladder to your umbilicus. And it's something you'll study in renal. Okay, question 39. Uh, a six-year-old comes to the pediatrician with a lump in the groin near the thigh and pain in the groin. A direct inguinal hernia. Because the herniated tissue, which of the following is it probably? So this one I didn't exactly like explain. That I didn't explain the correct answer, but I explained that 
Uh, yeah. Oh no, I actually explained the correct answer. Hey, 39. Come on, guys. Lateral to the inferior epigastric artery. A direct inguinal hernia. All right, let's look at the borders of the Hesselbach Triangle again, guys. We have the Hesselbach Triangle right here. These are our inferior epigastric arteries, right? So lateral to it would be over here. Medial to it would be over here. The Hasselbach triangle is medial. This is saying it is lateral. The lateral would not be a direct, a direct. Well, it will be an indirect. So, of course, it's E. It is E, someone, because as I said, an indirect hernia happens at birth or like in the first year of birth, maximum year of birth. Anything that happens afterwards, that's a direct turn. Yeah, immediately. And you don't need to, you don't really need to think about it. Okay. Uh, let me see. I think there was one more question that I found. Okay, there's this question. Simple question. Um so it's telling you the steward is doing a hundred crunches a day. He wants to hit it big. He lateral margin of the, okay, so lateral margin, the muscle small okay, defines which of the following structures. Alright, so this is just saying what do we call the lateral margin of the rectus abdominis? And I mentioned this. Yeah, it's a semilunaris. Yeah, semilunaris. By the way, the linea semicircularis is another name for the arcuate line. Linea semicircularis. It's another name for it. Uh, just a, a quick fact. Another one is, okay, this is another one, I think. Uh, emergent hernia repair is scheduled. The medical student assisting quickly reviews the anatomy atlas and is trying to commit to memory that the internal oblique muscle. What does it help? The internal oblique muscle forms which of the following or helps in forming which of the following? Let's see. Yeah. The conjoined tendon is made of two things. What are they? The internal oblique and the transverse abdominis. Inguinal ligament, what is it made of? Which muscle makes it? Yeah. Uh, no, the inguinal ligament is the external. The deep inguinal ring, what makes it? What's the structure that makes the deep inguinal ring? Don't tell me transverse, transversalis fascia, the fascia, right? Not the aponeurosis, the fascia or fascia or whatever. In terms of fascia, I didn't mention this, reflected inguinal ligament. That's, I think that's the name of the pectineal, the lacunar ligament. Okay. Uh, is there anything else? Okay, we're done. That's, that's all the questions that are for this lecture in this. Either. Fascia doesn't mean fat. It means connective tissue. It can be either fat, it can be just really thick connective tissue, like, you know, fibers. So that's the questions that I had kind of prepared because I really couldn't find, like even Ambos doesn't have questions on this lecture, which is very sad. I mean, it has questions on hernias, but I think hernias you're good with, inshallah. Uh, yeah. So does anybody have any specific, okay. Uh, I think we can stop the recording right now. And if anybody has any questions, uh, 